I hope you mean that and you're not just saying it because Justin told you to. Um, no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Uh, real quick, uh, let me just hear, I want to hear just out loud right now on the count of three. Tell me your favorite part of uh, the day or the week so far. Ready? One, two, three, go. <laughs> Sounds awesome. I love that. I like that. Uh, I want to, I, I just wanted to, this has nothing to do with the message. I just wanted to tell you what my favorite part is. Um, I, I'll be honest with you guys. Uh, I've been, I've been traveling around. I'm, I'm in school right now at 39 years old. I'm like, what am I doing? Uh, but I'm, I'm in school. <laughs> Woo, 39. Uh, so, um, I'm in school right now. I've been doing some traveling for school and, uh, you know, I've been, I've been having to to do some things like that. I've, I've done some other things at the beginning of the summer, so I haven't been home a lot uh, with my family. And so when I was driving down here, you guys, I was, uh, it was hard for me to leave my kiddos. Uh, my, my middle son, he's eight, and uh, he was like, why do you have to go? And it was like really like one of those like where they stood at the driveway and waved. And I was like, <laughs> I know. And so uh, I was driving down here and I was like, man, I was like, God, like, give me, give me your heart. And, um, I, and so I'm driving down to come hang out with you guys, but I was really missing home. And when I got in this room and got to worship with you guys, um, man, God just filled my spirit. And my favorite thing so far has just been standing right over here and uh, meeting my, my friend Joe right here. And, uh, and yeah, and, and just standing over here and worshiping with you, it has encouraged me and uh, getting to worship with uh, all of our friends at F -f Free. And um, yeah, if they're not gonna say the vowels, I'm not either. And so... But uh, yeah, it's been such an encouragement. Can we give it up for them real quick? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I say this to them all the time. I'll say it in front of you guys uh, just to show some honor. I love those guys. Um, uh, I've known some of them for a really, really long time. I've known Ian and London since they were in high school and they were just helping lead, uh, play guitar and sing some songs at their high school FCA. And I would come over to their high school and they were just pouring their hearts out. Um, I can remember going over there and helping out and watching them grow uh, has just been so amazing. And so super proud of those guys and have loved getting to just experience all this with them and, and with you guys. So. That's my favorite part of the day. I love you. Thank you for uh, just being uh, who you guys are. It's lifted my spirits and it's encouraged my heart and it's encouraged my faith. So thank you. All right. Love you back. All right. So uh, this morning, you guys, uh, sorry, that, that took entirely too long, but I wanted you to hear from me. But uh, this morning, uh, we jumped into what we said is a paradigm shifting parable, a story that Jesus told uh, that had the power and the potential that, uh, to shift the way that we see a lot of things. It, it, Jesus told this story, and when the people heard him tell this story for the first time, uh, the people that were listening that day, um, it was a paradigm shift for them in regards to how they view God, what they think God is like, who they think God likes, and, and how this whole faith thing works, right? And so we, we jumped into that story this morning, and we said that um, this has the potential to be a paradigm shift for us as well in regards to what we think God is like and who we think God might like and how this whole faith thing works for us as well. And so this morning, though, we, we, we spent some time really focusing on uh, two of the characters in the story, and these were the two sons, right? And what we learned uh, from these two sons is that uh, there's actually more than one way to be lost, right? We said, we said that there's actually more than one way to be lost. A lot of times we tend to focus on the younger uh, brother who uh, goes and lives in selfishness and in sinfulness and finds himself in a pig pen, right? Like, like we, we, we often focus on him, but we said there's actually another lost brother and it's the one who stayed home. And we said that it's possible to do the right thing with the wrong motive. It's possible to grow up in church and yet still be lost, that it's possible uh, to be be stuck in our own self-righteousness and pride, trying to earn things from God and completely miss relationship. And so he too was lost because we said lost is about relationship, not location. And then the challenge this morning, right, 
was as we looked at these two brothers, was, was to find yourself in the story, right? And, and I hope that throughout the day, I know you're out there and you're winning, you know, whatever, tournament, basketball, volleyball, I don't know what else y'all were doing, um, on double red flag, you're flirting, and oh my God, I got her number, camp girl, you know what I mean, like whatever, I don't know. So I know what you're, I, I know you're doing all that stuff, but then also I hope that at some point today, you had a chance to get honest with yourself. Maybe it was in small group, maybe you had uh, some quiet time today, maybe it was during beach worship, maybe it was just now during some of the singing, but, but I hope you had some time today to reflect on that and go, who am I in the story? Which, which one of these represents me? Or, or you know, maybe which one of these represented me and this is where God found me? And, uh, or, or maybe you just looked at it and you went, hey, uh, maybe I'm a little bit of both or, or this is who I have the tendency to be. But I hope you were able to reflect and to find yourself in the story. Now tonight, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick back up in that story, uh, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus tonight on the main character of the story which to many people's surprise is actually not the younger son. Although he's the one that gets uh, a lot of the focus in our sermons and in our songs, uh, he's the one who often gets a lot of the airtime. He's not the actual main character in the story. The main character in the story is the father. I told you guys this morning that in his parables, in his stories that Jesus would tell, he would include characters that were meant to represent us, but he would also also uh, always insert a character who was meant to represent God. And we said this morning that the Father is that character. He's the one meant uh, to represent God in the story, to teach us something about what God is like and who God likes and how he works. And so Jesus uh, inserts this father character, and y'all, he's the focus of the story. How he acts, how he reacts towards his son, that's the point of the story that we're meant to get. And that's where the real paradigm shift is. And so that's what we're going to do tonight is we're going to lean in and we're going to look at this father and we're going to see how he acts and we're going to see how he reacts. And it is my hope and my prayer. I've been standing back there worshiping and praying that, that you would get a glimpse of God's heart for you tonight. So just a little recap to get you to where we were in the story. You know, the father had how many sons? There you go, he had two sons, and the younger one came to him, and he said, Dad, uh, I want my inheritance, I wish you were dead, but you won't die, and so just give me your stuff so that I can go and do whatever it is that I wanna do, and I can go live my way, and I don't have to think about you anymore, and which would have been really, really offensive, and then to everybody's surprise, instead of the dad, Booyakasha and the son, instead, the dad actually gives him the stuff, and we said that that was an important detail because what it told us about God is that God God, he wants relationship, not robots. He wants sons and daughters, not slaves. And so he loves you so much that he will let you walk away. And then this son, he takes the stuff and he runs and he goes and he spends it on wild living. And then a famine comes and then he finds himself in a pig pen, right? Because you guys, we learned this this morning, that sin always takes you further than you wanted to go and costs you more than you wanted to pay. Always. And so here he finds himself, he's in the pig pen, and he's, he's in need, and while he's sitting there in the pig pen, it says that he comes to his senses and he realized things weren't so bad back with dad, and so he has this moment where he decides, I'm gonna go home. And now at that moment, though, like when he decides to go home, you guys, he has no expectations that his dad is going to welcome him back. I want you to know this. That as Jesus is telling this story and as people are hearing this story, this son decides to go home, but he has no expectations that dad is going to actually accept him back. He thinks, you know what? I'm gonna head home, and if I could just be sorry enough, if I could apologize profusely enough, maybe if I could come up with a plan in order to be able to pay him back, if I could show him that I'll work hard enough, then maybe, just maybe, I could be a slave or a servant in his house. And so this son, he gets up, he 
leaves the pig pen and he begins to walk back home, probably rehearsing you guys his apology speech the whole way home, right? Like some of you have done when you were late for curfew, you're driving home, you're like thinking, mom, so here's the deal, this is what happened, I'm so sorry, and you're rehearsing your apology speech the whole drive home. That's what he's doing. And that's where we're gonna pick up in the story. It says, it says that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. This is in Luke 15. If you got your Bibles, you can turn there. It's Luke 15. He says, but while he was still a long way off, while this son is still a long way off, he's a long way off from home. He's a long way off from where he knows he wants to be. He's a long way off from where he needs to be. He's a long way off from who he wants to be. He's a long way off from who he needs to be. He's a long way from home still. And Jesus says, though, that while he's still a long way off, he's not even close. He says, the father saw him. Do you know what that means, you guys, if the father saw him while he was a long way off? It means he was looking for him. It means that he was looking for him. It means he was, he was looking and waiting for the day that he would see the silhouette of his boy coming up over the hill. It means his dad was looking for him, and Jesus is communicating something to us, you guys that no matter how far off you might be, no matter how far off you might feel, no matter how far you have run, no matter who you are or what, you're, what you've done, your father does not give up on you. He keeps looking for you. Amen. That's good news, that's good news. Now listen, while he was still a long way off, the father sees him because he's looking for that silhouette. He's waiting for his boy to come home. He keeps going though and he says, while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with I know all of you achievers were like, I know the answer, it's right in front of me. I want you to stop though, hold on, don't answer it yet. What what would you if you didn't have it right in front of you, what what would you have put in that blank? What do you what do you think? What do you think God thinks about people who leave home and steal his stuff? What do you think God thinks about people who choose their own way and say, forget you? What do you think God feels about people who are a long way from home? I want you to personalize this a little bit more tonight. What do you think God thinks about you? And don't answer this out loud, I want you to think about this. What do you think, when he looks out and sees you, what do you think comes to mind? Last night, we were talking about what do you think about when you think about God? That's a really, really big deal. But also, another really, really big deal is what you think God thinks about when he looks at you. It affects how you relate to him. It affects whether you run to him or run from him. It affects whether uh, your relationship with him is, is a job or a joy. What do you think God would put in that blank when he looks at you? Be honest, not the church answer, the real answer. What do you think God thinks when he looks out and sees you? I talk to a lot of people, students and adults, and, um, and the words that they use to fill in that blank, I'll, I'll tell you some of the words that get used most often when people come into my office or when I meet somebody for lunch or for coffee and we're just talking about life and about faith, and if I were to say, hey, what, what, what do you think God thinks about you? You know the words that they use? Disappointed, frustrated, angry, disgusted, disinterested. Those are some of the words that a lot of people use. And those might be some of the words that you might use. I'll go ahead and tell you what I thought for a really long time. I thought that when God 
looked out and saw me, the word that I would have used was disappointed. Uh, if you would have asked me when I was a uh, middle schooler or a high schooler, what does God think when he sees you? I would have said, well, I was pretty, probably pretty disappointed. Not angry, but disappointed. Y'all know, has your parents ever used that one on you? I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. Which honestly hurts more, you know? You're like, I wish you'd just be mad and yell at me and we can move on, right? But you're disappointed, right? That's how I, that's how I thought God felt towards me. And because of that, you guys, because I thought God was disappointed in me, because I thought that when he looked down on me, he just thought, what are you doing? It meant that I spent most of my middle school and high school years almost all of running from God, wanting nothing to do with him because I was pretty sure he wanted nothing to do with me. As a matter of fact, I can remember you guys at 20 years old. At 20 years old, somebody asked me, they said, what do, you th what, what do you think about Jesus? Where are you at with Jesus? And I can remember at 20 years old, I said, man, I don't know what I think about Jesus, but I'm pretty sure I know what he thinks about me, and I don't think Jesus loves people like me. I just knew he was disappointed. I don't know what word you would put in that blank for what you think God thinks when he looks out at you, but I'll go ahead and tell you it's a big deal what you think he thinks about you. And it's affecting your relationship with him right now. Right now. Now Jesus is gonna tell us, and some of you were A students, four point whatever they give people now, threes, fives, I don't know, if they go over 100%, it's ridiculous. And so, so Jesus is gonna tell us. He says, but while he was still a long way off, his father looked at him and he was filled with, it. now you can say it with all your little gusto. Compassion, compassion. He says he was, he was filled with compassion and he, and he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. He says, man, this dad looks out at his son who's been afar, he, he went a long way away and he's still a long way off. He's not even close to where he needs to be or who he, he needs to be, but he looks out at him and, and the word that Jesus uses, it's not anger or disgust or disappointment or, or frustration, it's none of those words. He says he looks out and he feels compassion. The word in the Greek is this word, uh, splagnizome. Can you say that? Splagnizome. Where's all my real A students? You're like, compassion, I've got it. Splagnizome, blah, 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 blah. Right? Listen, the word in the Greek, it's, it's a word that means a deep care, concern, and love that you feel even in your guts. It's, it's like a, it, it is a love and a care for someone or for something that you feel physically. When I, was, when I was a little kid, my mom used to tell me, she would say, boy, I love you so much it hurts. And I was like, that's weird. Why are you saying that? I didn't understand it. I did not understand that, like, I love you so much it hurts. Like, what are you even talking about? And then, you guys, 10 years ago, uh, I had, I did not have, I can't do that, uh, but my wife had our baby girl. You don't have to clap for that. I mean, she, if she were here, you should clap, but I, did, I, did, I was only there for the fun part. So, listen, listen. 10 years ago, my wife, she gives birth to our, our firstborn, a baby girl, and I'm in the hospital room, and I'm holding this baby girl, sorry. And at that point, I knew what it was to love something so much, it hurts. I knew holding that baby girl that day, I'll go ahead and tell you this, that I would do anything for her. And I knew that day that there was nothing that she could do. She hadn't even done anything except cry and poop. Like, there's nothing she could do that would make me love her more. I loved her so much it hurt. And there's nothing that that little girl could do. No pain she could cause me. No amount of heartbreak she could give me that would make me love her less. I loved her so much, it hurt. 
Es bleibt nicht zu mir. Es ist, dass der Vater auf seinen Sohn sieht ihn und er ist noch ein langer Weg weg. Er hat es nicht zusammen. Er ist noch ein Mess. Er ist noch weit weg. Er hat es nicht zu Hause gemacht. Aber er schaut auf ihn und er sagt, ich bin voll mit Kompassion. This deep care and concern that you feel in your guts. And what Jesus is saying is, look, I don't know what you think God thinks about you, but I'll go ahead and tell you what God thinks about you. It's compassion. It's love and care and concern so much that he feels it in his guts. He loves you so much it hurts. That's what he thinks about you, and that's what he feels towards you. And so he sees his boy and he's filled with compassion, so much so that it says that he ran, he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. Now this would have been a big deal back in that culture that this dad is running out to the son. If, if you've heard sermons on this, you might have heard the, the, this about ancient Mideast culture, but um, in, the, in the ancient Middle East, um, that would have been a shameful act for a man to run. For men to run, uh, like it was, it was like a no-no, especially for patriarchs, like the, the man of the house. He didn't run unless it was an absolute emergency, right? Because in order to run, the reason why this would have been shameful is in order to run, you gotta hike up your robe and, and you gotta show your legs, which was disgraceful back then. I know it's not now. I've seen some of your shorts, guys, and so you're like... <laughs> I know, it's like skies out, thighs out, summer. And so it's like, <laughs> all right. Like, we get it, you've squatted down before, like, okay. But I realize, listen, I realize that this is like a weird thing for us, but in that culture, in that day where Jesus is telling that story, the idea of a dad running, that was embarrassing. It was shameful. People would have pointed and stared. They would have laughed. They would have mocked him. That would have been a shameful act, right? As the man of the house, like, like the thought was, I don't run to you, you run to me. Like, 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 like if, if there's any apologies or anything, like any restoration to be made, you're coming to me. I'm the one in authority. I'm the one that has the higher honor. I'm the one that needs to be respected. I don't run to you, you run to me. And yet this son sees his, this dad sees his son a long way off and he shamefully hikes up his robe and runs to his boy. Now, as I was reading this, the question that has come to my mind before. It's like, well, why, why did Jesus, I mean, this is a made-up story. Why, why, why did Jesus make this guy run in the story? What's he trying to teach us? Part of it is probably just, you know, love and excitement to see his boy. He's so excited. But I mean, like, to be honest, right, like, this dad could have stayed where he was at. He knows where the son is going. He, he, he knows what he wants to do. He still wants to forgive and restore. That can happen whether or not he runs or not. So why does Jesus make this guy run in the story? What's going on here? Is there something else or is it just love and compassion? So uh, I was doing some reading and I, I learned something recently uh, about that culture beyond just the the shame and the honor and the, all of that with the robes. And I learned that there was a practice in that day that everybody else listening to that story at that time would have understood in, in Jewish culture. And it was a, a practice and it was called kisatza. And the idea, that word, it just means cut off. It means to be cut off, to, be, to have a relationship severed. And the way that this practice worked is if, if somebody in a Jewish village or community, if they went outside of the village and they began, like if they married somebody who was a foreigner or a Gentile, or if they went and did business with a foreigner or a Gentile and they lost money, the money that was hard earned in the community, if they lost that money to a foreigner or a Gentile, now it's outside the community and it's outside the faith. They've brought shame to their village. And so now if that person wanted to come back and be a part of the community, they would have to face this, this process called kasatsa. And the way, that, the way that it would work is uh, when the person tried to re-enter the village, they would be brought in front of the village elders. And the village elders would want to 
hear this person's apology to make sure that they were sorry enough. They would want to hear their apology, and then they would want they, they, they would want them to go through some certain rituals and some certain religious practices in order to clean themselves up, to make themselves right again before God. And then they would also, they would want to hear this person's plan for how they were going to repay the community. Now, as a part of this process, the person's father, whoever was put on trial like this, the person's father would not be invited because of how much shame it would bring to him. And so the person's father would not be allowed to be there for the judgment And after hearing the apology and the plan and seeing the work being done, uh, what they would do is they would make, they would make a, they would make a judgment, the elders of the village, and they would decide whether or not this person, if they thought they were sorry enough or if their plan was good enough or if they had worked hard enough. And so they would, they would have this, this judgment. And if they didn't think that you were sorry enough, if they didn't think that your plan was good enough, if they didn't think that you could work hard enough in order to pay the village back, what they would declare over you was kasatsa. They would say, you're cut off. The relationship is severed. It's broken. And what they would do is they would take a clay pot and people in the villages would grab clay pots and they would come in front of the person and the person, each, each person in the village would come and they would And they would declare kasatsa. And they would say, our relationship with you is as broken as this pot. And you can't put it together. You've been severed. You've been cut off. You can't come back. Listen, the only way you could avoid facing kasatsa is if your dad welcomed you back into the family First, before you got into the community. The only thing that trumped the judgment of the community was the blessing of a father. And when I learned that, you guys, I realized why this dad is running. He's not just running because he's excited to see his son. He's running because he's trying to beat Kizatsa. He's not just running to welcome his son. He's running to save him because here's what he knows. He knows that boy has messed up, and he knows that boy went too far, and he knows that nobody in the village is going to accept his apology, and he knows that nobody in the village is going to hear uh, what he's got to say. He knows that because of his actions, what he deserves is kisatsa. What he deserves is to be cut off. What he deserves is judgment. But he knows if his son has to do that, he loses his boy forever. And so this father, while he's still a long way off, he sees his boy and he says, I'm going to beat the judgment. And he hikes up his robe. And what he does is he says, I'll take the shame so he doesn't have to. They can point at me. They can laugh at me. They can judge me. They can shame me. But I'm going to get to him so that they don't have to do that to him. I'll outrun his judgment. I'll take the judgment on myself so that he doesn't have to. That's why the father runs. Is he excited to see his son? Certainly. But he's not just running to see his son. He's running to save him so that relationship can be restored. So he runs. Enduring the shame. God bless you. (laughs) Wish I could have outrun that shame. So (laughs) this is what Kenneth Bailey says. Listen, this is what he said. He said, it is his compassion, the father's, that leads the father to race out to his son. He knows what his son will face in the village, and he takes it upon himself, the shame and the humiliation that is due the prodigal. This is why he runs. He runs out, outruns the shame. He takes it so the son doesn't have to so that he can have his boy back and restore him into right relationship so that he can bring him home. So, goes on. He gets to his son and when he makes it to him, it says that the son says to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But he's not even done with his apology speech. And it says, but the father said to his servants, quick, hurry, 
bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Let's bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And so they began to celebrate. Father, he makes it out to his son and gets out there to him and the son starts his speech. I gotta apologize, I gotta make sure he knows how sorry I am. Am I sorry enough? He's gotta hear my plan, but the father is having none of it. He's like, I don't even wanna hear your apology, right? Because you guys, that word repentance that we learned this morning, repentance is not about how well you apologize. It's not about proving or striving or straining or earning. It's simply about turning and receiving. That's what repentance is. It's turning to God and receiving his grace and his acceptance and his forgiveness. It's not about trying to be sorry enough or work hard enough or to prove anything or to earn anything. And so the father cuts him off. He's like, I'm not even hearing your apology. You're here. We've made it. We're together again. And the father, he says, bring a robe And he puts the robe on him in order to cover up his filth and in order to cover up his shame. And then he says, and bring my ring. And the ring signified like status back in the family. And so he's like, bring the ring, put it on him. He's restored to status in the family. And then he says, and bring sandals. And the reason why sandals are a big deal is because listen, in most households in that day and age, slaves and servants didn't get shoes. Only sons got shoes. And so he says, bring shoes, because he's not going to be a slave and servant in my house. He's going to be my son. So he brings it all, puts it on the son. He welcomes him back, and there is a celebration at his homecoming. Jesus tells this story, and you guys, people would have had to have picked their jaws up off the floor as they heard him talk about this. They would have had to pick their jaws up the, off the floor because what kind of father does that? What kind of father acts like that? What kind of father loves like that? What kind of father forgives like that? What kind of father welcomes prodigals home like that? Jesus says, yours, your heavenly father. That's exactly what he's like. Dr. Tim Keller, who passed recently, but he was a phenomenal pastor, preacher, leader. He said once, he said, this story is often called the story of the prodigal sons, which you've probably heard it as, but he said, but it's actually really more fitting that it would be called the the story of the prodigal dad. Because the word prodigal, you guys, it does not mean loss. It does not mean lost. It means means excessive or recklessly lavish. That's what the word prodigal means. And he said in his book, Prodigal God, he said, if anybody is, is excessive or recklessly lavish in this story, it's the father who is excessive and recklessly lavish in his love, in his forgiveness, in his acceptance, and in his grace. He says, so a better, a better telling of this story would not to be to call it the story of the prodigal son, it'd be the story of the prodigal father, or better yet, the story of a prodigal God. Jesus says, you want to know what God is like? He's like this dad looking for sons and daughters who, while they're still a long way off, he's looking for them to come home. And when he sees them, he runs to them. He doesn't demand that they earn their way back. He runs to meet them and he outruns their shame and he outruns their guilt and he outruns their judgment to meet them. And when he meets you, he will cover your sin with his righteousness and he will put a ring on your finger, giving you his status in the kingdom. And then he will put sandals on your feet because you are not a servant or a slave. You're a son and daughter in his house. He says, he says, you want to know what God is like? It's just like that. And you guys, not only, this is what I love so much about Jesus, you guys, is that not only does he say that's what God is like, but Jesus, 
our Savior, showed with his life that that is what God is like. Follow Jesus through the Gospels and you'll see someone who was looking always for those who were far. And when he found them, he would run to them. And ultimately, it's what he's done for us. He's run to us by, by walking to the cross. Jesus outran our shame, our guilt, our judgment that was due us. We deserved it because of the things that we've done. Because of our selfishness and our self-righteousness and our sinfulness, we deserved it. And Jesus outran it, taking it and nailing it to the cross, paying for it, taking our shame on himself so that we don't have to carry it. And then... By his resurrection, he offers us his righteousness to cover us. And a ring on our finger, he gives us his status in the kingdom. And he calls us sons and daughters. This is who Jesus is. He doesn't just tell us what God is like. He shows us what God is like. And so, yeah, you can clap for that. So, do you want to know what God thinks about you, it's compassion, it's love, it's grace, and he wants you to come home. And I don't think that it would be right for us to not have a moment tonight, as we've been reflecting on this story, to respond to the good news of this gospel that Jesus has told us and lived for us. And so I asked you earlier this morning, find yourself in the story, where are you at in the story? Are you far from home? Are you in the pig pen? Are you out on the hillside in your pride, striving and earning, but, but you're far from God in your heart, you have no relationship? What would it look like for you to come home? I wanna offer us here in a moment just the opportunity for, for those of you who you would say, hey, I've not put my trust in Jesus. I've not put my trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. I've, I've not, I've not put, turned and, and received his grace in my life in a restored relationship. And I would say, though, tonight it's time for me to come home. Uh, there are sons and daughters sitting out in the room right now, and it's time for you to come home. And all you have to do tonight to come home is to turn to him and put your trust in him. And if you will turn and put your trust, he will run to you, he will rescue you, he will redeem you, he will save you, and he will bring you back home with him. All you have to do is turn and trust. And listen, hold on, okay. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'm not going I'm not gonna ask them to lower the lights. I'm not gonna ask you to bow your heads and no peeking because you all peek anyway. I'm not, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna have that moment. Listen, because you don't live your life with your heads down and the lights off. You live life with the lights on and your heads up. And so, okay, and so tonight, if tonight you know, hey, I'm, I've been a far off, I've been far off from where I wanna be. I've been far off from who I know I'm supposed to be. I've been far off from who God's called me to be. I've been far from home, but I have heard the gospel, the good news that God loves me and there's grace for me back in my father's house. And so I wanna turn and trust in Jesus. If that's you tonight, if you wanna turn and put your trust in Jesus and receive forgiveness and a restored relationship with him, I'm just gonna ask you to stand up. And so if that's you tonight and you wanna stand up and put your trust in Jesus, go ahead. You can do that right now. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Adults in the room, if you're a leader of one of these students that's standing up, now would be a great time for you to show the Father's love and to run to them and to hug on them and to celebrate them and to thank God for the decision that they're making. So adults right now, I would love to give you that opportunity. Now, for those of you that are standing, listen, I do want to lead you in a prayer. And adults, you can pray with your, with your students. I do want to lead you in a prayer, but I want to remind you something. A prayer doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. 
A prayer can simply help mark the moment so that it's solidified and you can remember. When somebody asks, when's the moment that you put your trust in Jesus? You could say, it was back there at Big Stuff 2024. I was standing, I stepped, I turned, I trusted, and God met me and ran to me. That was the moment. And so we're gonna pray right now and I'm just gonna invite you. For those of you that are standing, I wanna invite you to pray this prayer. For those of you that are sitting, I'd encourage you just to be praying for your friends right now. But for those of you that are standing, I'd love for you to just pray this. Father, I am a sinner in need of a savior. Today I turn and trust in you. Thank you for running to me. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for forgiving me and for saving me. Thank you for making a place for me in your family. Thank you for bringing me home. Help me to live each day in light of this decision. Help me to live each day as a son or a daughter of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And listen, yes, y'all better get loud. Listen. Jesus told three stories, and in those three stories, you guys, he said that the result when, when any one sinner turns and trusts and comes home, that the result back at home is that there is celebration. So can we celebrate like heaven is celebrating right now? Celebrate the decisions that were made. Sing this together with everything. Scarlet. 